Are you looking to run your own security guard training school? Check out guardcardtraining.com. We have state approved security guard training materials, professionally printed and bound student manuals, PowerPoint presentations, knowledge checks, and final exams. Everything you need to run your own program. Just open the box and start teaching. GuardCardTraining.com. This is Masad Ayub, and you're listening to the Security Professionals Podcast with Alex Haddix. Welcome to the Security Professionals Podcast, brought to you by Security Training Center, LLC. This is your weekly source of news, tips, and education for the security specialist. I'm your host, Alex Haddix, and this is Episode 11, Criminal Predators with Dr. X. We have a treat this week. I'm going to replay an interview I recorded back in 2007 with Dr. X. I originally posted this interview as episode four of the Practical Defense Podcast. To this day, it is still, by far, the most popular episode that I have ever produced. It holds a tremendous amount of relevance to private security as it gives insight into the criminal mind from a psychiatrist who worked with a criminally insane for nearly 20 years. You'll have to excuse some of the audio glitches. My voice sounds off, but the important thing is that Dr. X can be heard clearly. As I mentioned before, it was my fourth podcast ever. I was still learning how to record and configure the microphone, which resulted in a lot of cleanup for this episode. So, I appreciate your patience. And here is the interview. Thank you, Dr. X. Thank you for coming to the show. Pleased to be here. So, Doctor, how did you come into contact with the criminals? What was what were you doing? By actually working with them. Um, you're speaking of criminals as if they were a unique group. But in actuality, they're with us in jails and prisons, but also in everyday life. And we meet them on the street, and uh, they'll be performing acts which will, upon conviction later on have them designated as an actual criminal. Now, you worked at a couple of different state prisons in the capacity as a psychiatrist. Is that right? Yes, yes. I uh, worked at uh, prisons in Hawaii and California, and then also went around to other states uh, as well. And I also uh, was present for evaluations at the Federal Correctional Institution, uh, I guess for the criminally insane, which uh, is down in the Louisiana area, Missouri. And in California, you worked where? I worked at uh, state institutions, uh, that is, uh, hospitals for the criminally insane, at prisons, at uh, jails. Uh, there was a joke I used to uh, have with a friend of mine, and when I would uh, lecture, uh, guest lecture to his uh, students, uh, he would say, and here's the man I met in prison in Mesa, uh, which is in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like you did that for quite a few years. They've receded into memory, you. <laughs> but uh, yes, it really occupied about twenty years of my life, and uh, technically, I'm still involved in it uh, on the faculty of one of our local universities. Okay, well, what type of convicts or criminals did you deal with? It's it's uh, tough to put them into a single group. Uh, What they wanted to use me for was to evaluate the individual. And they wanted me to evaluate the individual for his dangerousness within the institution. Could he be let loose within the institution or should he be locked up uh, singly? Um, Could he be trusted to perform on the yards where there would be less security available? 
could he perhaps uh, go out into the community on a community release program? And just to show you how accurate uh, I was, and I think that I was one of the better ones, I once evaluated a man who had been a bank robber, and both of his legs were shot and they had to be amputated. So I put him as a very low risk, and uh, we put him into a a local university so that uh, he could learn something and perhaps work on his uh, uh, intelligence for making a living rather than another way. And you know what that guy did? The guy rolled up in a wheelchair. He still had no legs. Brought out a shotgun and robbed the bank again. So, oh, <laughs> and I knew this is one person that I could predict would not rob a bank again. <laughs> so you're saying that this guy who had been convicted of bank robbery, who now had a disability, and he wasn't put into jail, he wasn't put you know, really into the, the hardcore criminal justice system, but he was being treated nicely. He was at the university. He was getting alternative training so they could do something with his life. And yet he decided to, you know, fight against all this stuff, go against the grain and rob again? Perhaps it was more psychological. Perhaps he feared to be released from the prison situation in which he was well taken care of and going out into the community and making a life on his own. Uh, But now, a uh, convicted felon, and uh, who was legless. He did have artificial legs, so uh, that he wouldn't be immediately noticeable, but perhaps he just felt the security of the prison. A lot of these people who have been in mental hospitals for a period of time or in prison, don't want to be released. It uh, is the same as when I was in the Marine Corps. I hated every minute of it, believe me. But when it came time to get an early release from the Marine Corps, as it was possible, but you had to apply for it, I waited for a week or two and then called my mother and said, I can get released. She said, what's your problem? Come on home. So with that, I came on home because even though I didn't like the situation, I had learned to live with it and became accustomed to the situation. Coming home, even returning home, was a different situation with different stresses and one that I hadn't been accustomed to. So I imagine the same with many of these individuals in prison. They know the life there. They know the they can exist under extreme conditions. And yet, it's better for them to do that than to go into the open, wide world in which things would change and there would be different stresses that they couldn't predict and hadn't become accustomed to. And just on a quick side, you were a Marine during World War II, is that correct? So you're a World War II veteran? Yes, yeah. You know, to the average person, that really, that seems incomprehensible you know for for us as a civilian the the worst thing that could happen to you is to have your life taken away your your um freedom taken away and being incarcerated for a certain number of years what you're suggesting is that these people like it or they're not afraid of it or at least they prefer that type of unknown to the unknown of the outside world i mean i mean to us it, it's You know, that seems like the ultimate punishment, but to these people, they almost seem to prefer it. They're accustomed to it. It's their life. That's what they know, and they have survived under it. You go out into the wide world, and you could starve to death. You may not have friends like you do there in prison. It's uh, a different mindset. So when it comes to crime as we experience it, it doesn't seem like jail time is really that much of a deterrent. I worked at a federal prison. It's actually a correctional institution, as designated. And there was an old man there. And he did low-level crime. He would put a burning piece of paper into a mailbox 
and wait for them to come by and arrest him. He got two years prison time for that and served at a minimal correctional institution. At that institution, he would be the gardener. He would go outside. uh, He would take care of the flowers and work around and come back at night. He had a place to sleep. He had three good meals a day. He had his friends there. And he collected Social Security at the time while he was in prison. So he would wait for his 18 months of uh, imprisonment to finish. That's with good time of six months. And then he would go out, spend his Social Security money, living high. And then he would perform the same act once again. Something about a mailbox, pushing in, trying to get mail, and get another two-year sentence uh, with 18 months of serving. So he had his life, and it was very good to him. He lived high uh, for his time out until he ran out of money, performed another low-level offense, and returned to prison, saved money, and went out. Well, I guess if you look at it in the terms of you know three square meals a day and free health care, it, it might be better than what they had before, which you know, or grew up with, which could be nothing. And he was an old man. He had no family. He was alone. When his money from the prison Social Security ran out, because you can't live too well on Social Security, but his stacked up while I was in prison, um, he would return. He was a gentleman. And they knew him there. They knew he wouldn't escape. <laughs> and so he had a very nice gardening job, taking care of the lawns and the flowers around the prison. It's not something for me, but it was for him. He had no family, no friends. He knew everybody in prison. The guards were his friends. He had known them for years and years. And that was his way of taking care of himself. Uh, He was in his 70s, maybe even in his 80s doing this. Much better life than if he'd been out by himself uh, trying to live on Social Security, which is almost impossible. Well, let's take a look at the other end of the spectrum. What about these these kids, these children who commit these heinous crimes, you know, in their late teens and sometimes early teens, and sometimes they're tried as an adult, but they spend their careers, you know, they start their careers as criminals very early. What starts these people down this path? I mean, what... What causes what could be good people to go bad? Is it socioeconomic? Are they wired differently? Is it a chemical imbalance? You know, from from a civilian's perspective, it, it seems almost impossible to commit some of these things, and yet you hear about them. What causes them to do it? What gives them the capacity to do it? To, to do the things that they do, it just doesn't seem normal to us. How can they do these things? And it doesn't even seem like they think twice about it. I certainly wish I could answer that. Um, A young person doesn't have the experience of being hurt too much themselves. And so he's unaware of the pain that he causes when he goes out and injures someone or kills them. And uh, in another aspect, some of them grew up this way and think that this is the normal way of doing it. If we go back into the past and look at Genghis Khan, he came over, he probably killed four or five million people. Or in the killing fields of Cambodia, two or three million people were killed by that. But that was a different viewpoint of the value of life which was not very high. And many people feel that when they're through with this horrible life on earth, there's a place called heaven or whatever uh, it's called in their particular religion that they go to. And this is why you you have so many of these armies, even today, uh, going out and killing and be killed. And it really makes no difference to them because their religion puts them in another arena, and that they die for something that's positive 
and they achieve an ever after afterlife that is so positive that it beats everything on earth. But what about I it's mean, almost a religious viewpoint. It almost sounds like you're talking about some of the religious extremism we're seeing in various parts of the world and in the Middle East where you know, if they do these things and these jihads, they, you know, get uh, like 72 Vestal Virgins when they're in the next life and things like that. What about these t- stories from like the, you know, the old American West, the old West? In fact, I know you've, you've written a book you know, on old West Los Angeles. But, you know, we heard about the, all these stories about these crimes, these gangs that would come in and destroy half the town and slaughter people and things like that and then come in and take over. So how does that fit in with, you know, modern society? Is it really all that much different? Or are these stories just, you know, stuff they made up in the movies in Hollywood? Oh, they definitely did. Uh, We could look upon Los Angeles. And uh, in about 1850, there were perhaps 3,500 people living in Los Angeles. They had five murders a day. And they didn't count the Indians that they killed. Wow, that is a huge percentage of the population as it compares to Los Angeles now. Los Angeles was the deadliest city in the United States by far. And it sometimes seems to me that it hasn't changed much. (laughs) It seems like they thought of life as being really cheap back then. Has that really changed with modern society? Has have we, you know, have we consider ourselves grown higher so that life is more valuable these days? Is it just because we're in a modern post-industrial nation and and we're better than that? Have our attitudes really changed since then, or have we just kind of glossed over things? Were these types of events considered horrific back then, or are they just considered horrific by today's standards? First of all, when Los Angeles, well, actually, Los Angeles was known as a Pueblo in 1781, so we've been around for 250 plus years. But uh, beginning in the 1850s, it uh, changed to be a ciudad designated by uh, Mexico, so it would be a city. Pueblo City, and uh, at that point, there began to have a city government. There really wasn't any before then. You had a loose collection of the uh, land grant holders, uh, the biggest ones of Spanish origin, and then the uh, second largest of uh, uh, Mexican land grants. And they had the rules and established everything. And they would go out, and if anyone intruded upon them, they would gather their friends and they would go out and raise a posse and go after them and hang them. And this was taken over by the first uh, Westerners. Um, I shouldn't say Westerners. I should say first uh, uh, Americans moving west. And uh, they did the same. And they went out and collected these banditos. And, uh, well, I'm sorry, which, which banditos? The, the grant holders, the land holders, <laughs> or the people coming in? The, the ones who killed and robbed uh, of them. And uh, when you've, if you really want to look at the West as we know here in California, uh, cattle were scattered across our hills, but nobody owned them. And they were run by Indians. The Indians were our first vaqueros uh, in California. And then gradually they were replaced, uh, and they were the vaqueros for the Spanish and the Mexican land grant holders. And then later on it became more institutionalized uh, um, with the other... uh, definitive land grants uh, coming in. And we would establish posses to go out. 
and get those that we considered banditos, uh, robbers of uh, individuals, killers of individuals, and we would eliminate them. And sometimes the posses uh, were really criminals themselves because not all posses were limited to uh, apprehending and hanging individuals who had committed crimes. They made a lot of mistakes. So the way you're making it sound is that the criminal element, the criminal element has been around since the very beginning and that really much hasn't changed over the century or millennia. Well, didn't Cain slay Abel? <laughs> that goes back for a long ways. That does. So what percentage of the population do you think we currently have, you know, as far as a criminal element? I mean, when you look back to early Los Angeles, like you said, you know, less than 4,000 people, but there were five murders a day versus today where there are, you know, 10 to 15 million people in Los Angeles and the, you know, reported murder rate per day probably really isn't much more than that right now. So have have things gotten better over time? Is it uh, a better police force? Um, are the statistics being recorded differently? Um what about uh, deterrence? I mean, back then, if you were caught for murder, you were killed. So, you know, you murder, you, you got killed. Um, there wasn't really much in the way of, a, you know, a trial or a jury by peers, as we might have today. Was the threat of capital punishment really a deterrent? Well, it certainly was a uh, deterrent uh, if you were caught. And they had a hangman's hill here in Los Angeles where they would uh, hang people on particular gallows. And I believe that one day they hung 18 or 19 people there. And then there was this horrible incident in uh, 1881, I believe, where there was a uh, fight amongst the Chinese. And then in trying to stop it, uh, one of the... one of the sheriffs was injured. And as a result, they just went down and selected 18 members of the Chinese population and hung them. At random? Yeah. Well, they just grabbed the first 18 they could get and took them up and hung them on the Hangman's Hill in uh, 1881. So it was really very random. And uh, there would be theories as to why uh, that could be done. Uh, because you make an example, and if anything happens, the guilty and innocent will be hung for the act. That's one of the famous uh, incidents of uh, barbarity in Los Angeles. That was in 1881. That's not very long ago. Uh, the uh, One of the major problems is that these cities, as they developed, had no unifying body. They may have had a, a uh, mayor, but they didn't really have a police force because they didn't have taxation to the extent that they could pay these people uh, and have a really strong police force. So that's why that they were very weak and why the posses had to be raised. And uh, with untrained men just rushing off to enjoy the uh, fun of it, uh, you find that uh, sometimes they executed, uh, hung, shot, burned uh, innocent people. And that's documented. Of course, even today, we know that uh, we incarcerate and sometimes execute innocent people. Well, hopefully today the, the process for selection isn't so entirely random. Uh, but moving back to incarceration... Uh, with the people that you dealt with, how and why did these people get on the path that they were on? How do they wind up in jail? What drives them to prey on other people? I think you have all sorts of theories regarding why, and it would look more upon the individual uh, than upon any act of society uh, which causes them to start. Sometimes a person gets in a position and he's wrongly accused 
and remains in that position from that time on. Other times, uh, usually when young, uh, they get into these areas in which their raging hormones cause them to act out, uh, as well as their lack of experience in being able to find other avenues of solving the problem. And I think that a lot of juveniles fall in this group. Uh, they're arranged in gangs, uh, although I shouldn't use gangs because that's always pejorative. I think that uh, some of the groups that they're in are, would be clubs. I remember from high school clubs. And so let's say that. And uh, sometimes they get a wrong turn and then continue in on that because they go along with a pack, uh, just like a pack of dogs. One dog by itself is usually rather harmless, but you get four or five running together, and uh, no man can control them. And then they become a wild pack and sometimes have to be destroyed as a pack. Humans aren't that much different. They did some studies on rats, and they had rats in a cage, and everything was fine until they added more rats. And at a certain point in the experiment, when they added so many rats that space was limited to them, and how large that space was, I, I don't recall, then the rats would attack one another because they needed a certain amount of space around themselves. And look at our world of today. More people becoming compressed. And uh, I think that some of our criminal responses, uh, which are just acts deemed by society to be unwanted and termed criminal, are due to overcrowding. This is perhaps one of the reasons why certain areas of our city have a higher rate of crime than elsewhere. There just doesn't seem to be an avenue for those individuals who are there to use their innate ability to move on and create space for themselves. I think it's going to get worse in the future. So you're saying there's a serious risk of an increased crime rate based on population density? I think that's one theory, yes. Because we don't change. The population density increases and we're still there. We still want our space uh, around us. We still want a way to succeed. But if it's blocked by a large number of people, we have to search for another way. And the other way is uh, mainly an explosive way of doing it. Uh, hopefully, our world of today is creating an area that we can expand our thoughts. And I think that the interworld, the Internet, is one way of expansion. And so you expand your abilities there in which you're free and able to succeed uh, as opposed to being uh, oppressed. Wow, that's the, the strongest advocacy for the Internet I've ever heard. Well, you know, this, the, the density and the increase and in the, the stress put on by the population density explains things like crimes of passion and, and road rage. But what about the other types of crimes? But what about cr economic crimes? What about the, the thug who comes up and puts a gun to the back of your head and demands your wallet? What, what makes it okay in, inside of his head? What makes it to him seem like it's an okay thing to do to take something by force something that doesn't belong to them you would think that something like that would be instilled either you know from from birth by parents by by instinct that it's not right to take something that's not yours i don't think that there's anything ingrained in us or innate within us to define what's right and what's wrong. So you think that... I think that it's learned. So what you're saying is that it's the laws and the enforcement of the laws that, that keep society together, that keep us from 
at be ripping each other's throats apart? Yes, but let's expand it further than laws. I think it's your family and how you learn to interact with people from the very beginning uh, that keeps us within the range of norms so that we don't often explode. Uh, stress is an incredible factor in our life. And in the uh, streets, in driving our car, we have road, road rage because of the stress of driving. And then the other person there does something that enrages you. And you're in your car, isolated. You think that you can get away with it because he doesn't know you. He's a stranger. And so you'll take out a gun and shoot him, fire at him in any event. This usually happens after 2 o'clock in the morning. And there are victims who are really innocent just driving around the road and someone gets upset by what they do or even don't do. He may be upset from another factor and pulls out a gun and shoots them. See, it's at night. He thinks he's going to get away with it. And because he's unknown, he won't be apprehended. And he'll drive off into the night. And a lot of these cases of uh, road raid are never solved because the driver of the uh, car drives away and is never seen again. Do you think that a person that's in the throes of a, of road rage is really that cognizant of the laws and thinking whether or not they're going to be caught? Yeah, he's not cognizant of anything. If he thought he'd be caught, he wouldn't do it unless his anger has overwhelmed everything. Uh, he feels that he can get away with it. There's no other car on the road. Uh, it's dark. He can get away. And he just responds that way. That's pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> if you read the paper carefully, most of these shots fired at cars in the night are after 2 o'clock, after 2 a.m. Now, 2 a.m. also just happens to be, at least in California, the times that the, the bars close down. Do you think there's any correlation between alcohol and these types of crimes? I think there's a correlation between alcohol and any type of crime. It relaxes you, and yet it excites you because it has a disinhibiting effect uh, upon your brain. And you don't really think as well under the influence of alcohol as you do. And as a result, you'll find various acts are performed under alcohol that would not be performed uh, without it. So in your experience with the criminals that have been caught in, in the jail systems, how often would you say that drugs or alcohol were involved in the when people committed these crimes, of being under the influence of these things? I would say the majority. No question in my mind. Unless you get a purely white-collar crime, sophisticated, then uh, alcohol probably has little to nothing to do with it uh, because that takes thought, preparation, uh, advanced planning, and that would not be possible under alcohol or drugs usually. They may be thinking about it and then later on do it uh, under the association of drugs. But I think that the white-collar crimes whereby someone disappears with $200 million are not associated <laughs> with alcohol or drugs. Okay. I'm going to ask a chicken and egg type question. Do people commit these crimes because they're on drugs or do they contemplate the crime and then take the drugs to relax or build up courage? I think that they think about it. And then some types of crime require false courage, especially those that are very simple acts, such as taking out a gun and robbing somebody. Um, I suspect a lot of those are associated with alcohol and drugs uh, because they 
Uh, drugs and alcohol is a drug uh, affects your ability to think and uh, to realize your results of the consequences uh, of your act. There was a uh, approach in California which reduced the criminal, which reduced the sanctions for criminal acts if they were under the influence of alcohol or drugs. So they gave them a buy if they were drunk or stoned at the time? They, not a buy, but uh, uh, it was diminished capacity because they didn't, dev- didn't have the full capacity to consider everything, and it was diminished by alcohol or drugs. Actually, that isn't totally accurate, because you see, alcohol is a legal substance. So therefore, taking alcohol was legal. And if under the influence of a legal act that you didn't have the capacity to think, then it was called diminished capacity. But because drugs were illegal from the beginning, so before you had any drug in you to reduce your capacity... You took it. That was an act that was criminal. And so diminished capacity was possible if a crime were convicted, uh, were performed under alcohol, but not under drugs, because the act of taking the drug was illegal. Is that the case today? I think diminished capacity has essentially been uh, eliminated, although it may be argued in courts. Now, the people that you dealt with, the, the convicted criminals, did they ever show remorse for the crimes they committed or the, the people that they harmed? I think I'm going to respond by saying no. There must have been several that did it, uh, but they showed no remorse. Uh, there was one person I was working with in prison, and uh, he said, you know, doctor, I'm not going to do this again. It's just not worth it. So I thought, my golly, I finally reached somebody. And he said, next time I'm going to kill all the witnesses so I won't end up here. Oh, man. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> that gives me a warm fuzzy. Well, that's it. You see, they, they focus. Uh, and he was serving years in prison because of some act. Uh, they focus upon not getting caught. And that was a real problem, getting caught. So the regret here was was getting caught and had nothing to do with the damage they caused or the hurt they inflicted. Actually, no remorse whatsoever. There's one interesting case in which there was remorse, but it uh, came out in a very unusual way. I was evaluating this one woman who was imprisoned for bank robbery. Most unusual for a woman. And she said, you know, I'm happy to be in prison. My parents divorced. And when I was 12, my mother remarried. She married a nice man. But she began to pay too much attention to him, forgetting me. And so I went to the police and told the police that that man was molesting me. And he was sent to prison for 10 years for an act he didn't do, because I testified against him in court. And she said, I think that I robbed this bank so that I would end up in prison and pay for my act of false testimony and lying against them. So that's how sometimes our psyche works. Unfortunately, I think there are very few people uh, in prison who uh, have remorse for it. She was one of them, not remorse for her prison act, because she liked being in prison, paying back what she caused this innocent man uh, to do. I don't even know what to say after that one. 
It's, it's just horrible. Well, uh, false testimony is easy to do, easy to give. And it takes a stroke of luck to be able to oppose it when you have facts that saying, this is false, you're lying. Because how could they in a case like that? So because it was just a question of he said, she said, there was no physical evidence. It was just off the testimony of a, of a child. Right. didn't understand the, reper- the long-term repercussions. Well, that, she that did. Man's, that man's life, well, when she was an adult, but I mean... That no, 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 she put him away yeah. when she was young. And so she understood what was happening to him, doing it deliberately, because she wanted her mother back. So it was just jealousy. Well, <laughs> jealousy is perhaps too vague a term. <laughs> Maybe she was still basically upset that her mother divorced and she didn't have a real father there. But uh, in listening to her, I uh, was taught that there are all sorts of reasons why things are done. And uh, the reasons are often ununderstandable. But... uh, We don't understand life either. <laughs> yeah. When it comes to these criminals, these these predators, is there any way that we can identify them? I mean, in the movies, they the criminals always dress differently. They always dress up like gangsters or, you know, they have this innate feel of evil to them or, you know, they have their own theme music. Or in the, the old days, in the old movies, you know, you had the good guys – in white hats, and you had the bad guys in the black hat. So if he was wearing a black hat, you knew he was a bad guy. And if he was in a white hat, he was a good guy. What about modern society and real world? Is there anything we can do how to identify these types of people? Maybe not to identify with them, but certainly I think you can protect yourself. If you're on the street, if you're driving, don't stare at someone. Why? What does is, what is staring do? If they're paranoid, they'll think that you're after them. And then they will respond by shooting you in the car um, or by crashing the car. I think that a lot of these accidents are really when one car forces the other car off the road uh, because someone glanced at them. Maybe the drivers were just trying to escape a criminal offense, but you don't know. And then all of a sudden you're the victim of something like this. On the uh, street, I certainly wouldn't stare at anybody on the street uh, because they'll have the same response. And they could be armed with a gun, with a knife, uh, or just the large number possible. There is one case I was uh, involved with Uh, evaluating the woman. And she said that uh, two women came by and stared at her and the others and made some sort of remark about them whereupon she and her friends got up, captured and kidnapped those women, and uh, took them home. And uh, the women were then separated. The men at the home repeatedly raped them. And then one woman was taken to a strip joint uh, where she waited uh, naked upon tables. And uh, they collected her pay and her tips. And they may have forced her to engage in prostitution. I can't remember that exactly. And then they would take her home, and the next night the other woman would go out. And they did this for about two weeks. This was in Los Angeles just a few years ago. Well, how, how could that happen? I mean... What about the strip club owner? I mean, was he in on it? 
How could somebody be forced to work like that? It sounds like a slavery situation. Because if she didn't work, her friend who was back at the home with these people would be killed and cut up. So she didn't say anything. Okay, so that's why. So she tried to escape. She was worried about her friend being hurt. I can't recall how they finally got out of it, but I think that uh, she was able to tell somebody, and then the police came in and found them at home. And that's because these two women just walked by and made some remark about the women sitting at the table. Wow. So It's a horrible society that we live in, but it's no different than any time of life. I just happened to have a repository of these stories because of what I was in. I was involved in uh, an evaluation of them. Uh, that's why I can tell this to you, and you've never heard them before. As you've said, you, you've dealt with some of the really seedier sides of society and the people that perpetrate horrible crimes on other human beings and seen and heard things probably that most people really shouldn't see or hear. Um, over the course of your, your duties when you were there, did you ever feel frightened? Did you, were you ever uh, in fear for your life? Pleased that I was sitting across the table from them. Sometimes they were manicured, manacled to the table. Uh, there was always a guard within call. Um, I spoke with them confidentially, but as I say, there was always a guard available for me. And uh, I felt very secure. I was in prison, locked up with them too. But you see, there's someone to protect me. But they never had to act. Were you ever threatened? Never directly. Okay, that begs the question. What do you mean by directly? I perceived it as an indirect threat. So either through the, like their their body language, um, word choices, the, you you felt that your life was threatened. So I, I know that one of the reasons why we're keeping your identity secret is because you know you were concerned about you know some of these people um, tracking you down, and uh, you know you've dealt some with some really nasty people over the years. Well, they're probably all dead by now uh, because people who live like this uh, die young and uh, early, but um, it's still not comfortable for me talking about them this way. Uh, or at least with some way that they can track you down. I don't think that anyone's around now. <laughs> <laughs> Their life expectancy is rather short. Yes, like small favors? <laughs> oh. uh, there's one thing of interest. Uh, there was a study of uh, individuals incarcerated in the local jails. And 45% of them had a discernible mental illness. Okay. Could you define what a discernible mental illness is? That they could look at the individual and evaluate them and uh, name a mental illness. Uh, see, I'm not saying that only 45% had it because you may not have been able to see it. But... Uh, they were able to diagnose the mental illness in 45% of the people in the jail. That is perhaps due to the Lanham and Petrus Short Act. I think there has been a change in it now. And uh, this act has... lessened the ability of society to involuntarily hospitalize those individuals with mental illness. But then what happens with these people with mental illness? They may be unable to function, they can't work, so they go out and steal food. Then they get locked up in jail. And now instead of being treated in the mental health system, they're treated in the legal system, in the jails. And so it's increased the number of mentally ill people in jails. 
because they've given them larger civil rights, but they don't change the criminal rights or criminal responsibilities. So there's been a shift uh, in our population, and our uh, jails are really holding mentally ill people who may and definitely did perform acts which were illegal, but maybe minor, and maybe before they could be handled on the path of the mental illness rather than the criminal uh, justice system. <sighs> Pendulum has swung so that uh, people can't be locked up or placed in involuntary confinement because of a mental illness or the acts of it. They have to proceed in the criminal justice system, which then uh, paints them with a different brush and a different color. Well, Doctor, I really appreciate the time you spent with us, and I'm also certain that our listening audience has as well. My pleasure, and thank you. I have a few words before I close out the show. When I recorded the interview, there was still some slight concern over the safety of Dr. X and his family. Since nearly a decade has passed since that interview, the risk is pretty much negligible at this point. Dr. X is my father. People often ask why and how I got into personal protection and eventually teaching physical security, and the answer is because of my father. Because of his work in the criminal justice system, our family was under constant threat by convicted serial killers, rapists, and other violent criminals. Even while my father was on duty at the prison, they would call our home and threaten to send their friends over to rape and kill us all. And how these convicts got our unlisted phone number and home address is an entirely different story. My mother tells stories of how my father, while shaving in the morning, would offhandedly tell her, if I go missing, have the police check out these guys first, and then he would give her a list of names. His life was threatened on a daily basis, but as he tells it, only about one per week was credible. Needless to say, I grew up in a home with lots of security protocols. I would love to have my father on again for more interviews. He is the most brilliant and accomplished person I have ever met. A doctor, a lawyer, an honorary Native American chief, a Marine Corps World War II veteran, and as an Army colonel, Operation Desert Storm Desert Shield veteran. He also taught both law and medicine for decades. Unfortunately, he now has advanced Alzheimer's, and sometimes even forgets who I am. So this and my other interview with him about road rage are probably his last interviews. Well, that will do it for this episode of the Security Professionals Podcast. If you have any tips you'd like to share with everyone, a comment on a show, or if you would like to suggest a topic for an upcoming episode, write into podcast at security-training-center.com. Or you can leave us a voicemail at 909-742-0649. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, stay aware. Stay safe. Joel Klein catches a 7 o'clock train after his evening CPR class at the American Red Cross. Ron Garrity's on the same train. He's had a rough day and doesn't feel like himself. Until he feels the sudden tightness in his chest, Ron never thought he'd actually have a heart attack. Until Joel is administering CPR, he never thought he'd actually save a life. When you train with the Red Cross, you change a life. Starting with your own. Call 1-800-RED-CROSS or visit redcross.org to learn about life-changing opportunities in your area. The Security Professionals Podcast is Copyright Security Training Center, LLC. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution, Non-Commercial, No Derivatives, 4.0 International License. An archive of previous episodes can be found at security-training-center.com slash podcast.